Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. Okay. So we approve tonight. So I didn't pick one. Um, we have one adjustment to the agenda. We'll get to a little later about uh, stop signs. So, um, um, Zach and John, do you want to go first? If you'll have us, Richard. Gordon. Gordon. Yeah. Richard. Yeah. Yeah. Just go ahead. We're here mostly because, as you know, the legislative session is starting up. And so we're checking in with town managers and select boards and the police chief manager. Um, did I say school boards? School boards, select boards, all these school managers. Just to see if there are issues that we should know about. We don't need to take much of your time. We don't have any presentation for you. Um, the one thing that's different this year is the the request is the, the date we have to request bills has been moved up until December, early December sometime. So we can't wait till the session starts if there are bills that we need to introduce for the town. Um, so it used to be later. Used to be after the session started. And I didn't go into why we made that change, but it's not that interesting. <laughs> So we're interested in hearing, um, you know, making sure that we're aware of what's going on in the town, in case we missed anything, uh, and so we can represent the town the best we can, uh, but also if there is anything specific that we can introduce on behalf of the town, uh, we'd like to be able to do that. And, uh, mm -hmm. So okay. we're going uh, to, we, we can certainly answer questions, or if there's, if you guys just want to tell us what's going on, or um, concerns, issues. Sure. Well, I, I can start. Um, at a Hartman community breakfast when yourselves and our senators uh, attended, um, our senator from Woodstock was talking about an expectation that funds associated with the Clean Water Act and the, and the Vermont roads um, would be not funded. Um, and Portland has been looking at meeting the, stand, the new state standards that are out there, um, especially in the area of hydraulically connected segments on the roads. Um, and we have a big price tag associated with that work. And if the state funding should dry up, that's going to have a major, major impact on, on, on our community. Um, so I would just ask you to sort of do your best to shepherd level funding for that or continue that. Um, do you see that as an, an annual thing that's going to go on for Well, it's a, years it's a state years. requirement. Uh, Dave, help me. By 2010 and 2015, we have different percentages of the roads, uh, which we've identified through the help of two rivers, uh, that, that need to be done by state mandate. So, uh, and for us to meet that with our current workforce and including subcontracting, it's going to take us a number of years just to get to the 2025. Is 2023. it 2023? 23. Okay. So, uh, so we, you guys have until 2036, is my understanding, to get all the roads up to standard. And in conversations I've had with Dave, the concerns are uh, around. Um, that we have a lot of money available right now. It's five million dollars until 2023 uh, to to get our roads up to standard. But um, not sure what happens after, after that. that. Um, yeah. And so it's a partially funded mandate right now because there's a somewhat of a match with the town. Um, and so we hope that this doesn't become an unfunded mandate mm -hmm. after 2023. Okay. If you can possibly share estimates for the yearly costs, expected expenses to, to do that mm -hmm. would be helpful just so we have that information yeah. right in hand as we, we, we it's going to be a, you know, an appropriations thing. Yeah, the committee, the subcommittee within town, which is <coughs> two select board members, two planning commission members, and two citizens, plus Dave, uh, we've actually just recently calculated those costs so we can pass those along. That, that would be helpful. I know there was some, some talk at some point about, uh, because class four roads are included in this, and there was some 
Heartland has quite a few class four roads, and there was, yeah. I was curious if there was any thought about, you know, there was um, talk at some point about potentially converting class four roads into legal trails. Is that, did, uh, has there been any discussion with that or uh, with the Vermont Legal Cities and Towns or the Regional Planning Commission to? Um, Gordon, I'm not aware of that. Um, no, I'm uh, just thinking about the implications of that. I don't know. Certainly, um, there's a, an active Jeep club in Woodstock. I don't think that's a very good idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one issue that um, they brought up a lot in <coughs> Windsor was the <coughs> prison property. And I don't know whether we have any opinion. It's obviously not in Heartland, but it's very close to Heartland. Mm -hmm. And um, we're checking in. I don't know if, like I said, do we have any ideas or For things housing, that we do we need want housing. or don't want to see there? I think generally Windsor residents and the select board don't want to see a mental health or another correction facility go in there. But they also don't want it to just sit there and become derelict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need housing yeah. in this area. Right. Is there any talk of that? Uh, there is, but of course that would require someone to come up with the financing to someone interested in developing the property, either with the buildings that are there or tearing it down. So one of the problems with that property <coughs> is if you can't use those buildings, it's a huge liability because you're probably looking at at least a million, maybe two, to clear out the stuff, knock down the fences, knock down the buildings. Town, or the state, I mean, they get a free ride for years on taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think they should be coming in and helping that town out. I don't disagree. So. <laughs> I only have, we only have two homes. I know, but I'm just thinking that should not be an option. And I mean, and that's really, it's become a really silly situation where it's just sitting there, it's costing us two to 300000 a year to mothball it. And if we just could have all that money at once, we could clear the land and it would be a, a really ideal property because it's got sewer and high, you know, what is the power wattage. There's a really good electric service there and roads. Good fences. Roads, so. Uh, so. It might be a little bit more for housing. I don't know what it would be like that or not. It's what do you mean? It's not any further than where you live, or no, it isn't. so. <laughs> Still, <laughs> no, but yeah. it'll reinvigorate their school system, right? What do you? I think affordable housing. I mean, Windsor County in general mm -hmm. needs housing. I mean, we, we barely have enough housing to fill the, our job needs. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, but I guess what I've heard uh, is that um, affordable housing. There's it is, uh, you know, Heartland, where you're used to rural living, but there, uh, if, if you're a low-income family and you don't have a car, there's no other resources to even get yep. into town or to be involved with the community, and that's a pretty important aspect. Okay, well, but, but if you don't want to do affordable, if, if that's not reasonable, how about just uh, just housing? You know, just for, you know, Jane and Joe Smith, yep. who are middle income. Mm -hmm. For Jane and well, Jane or Joe and I, Joe. I think that's a really I don't want to be idea. exclusive. Mostly I, we were, I was wondering whether the town had given any thought because it is so close to Heartland on things that we don't definitely don't want to see or if there are any brilliant ideas. And housing is a great one. We're but thinking I, of again, that. Again, it's going to have to be, someone's got to come forward with a proposal. They did, and they asked, um, as far as I know, there are no proposals on the table where uh, that the, um, well, John knows a little bit more about where the chair of the Prisons and Penitentiaries Committee is leaning, but there's, they're, I think they're keeping an open door to the possibility of more prison housing. Um, and as a result, more mental health, or mental health um, because there perhaps is some need there. Um, but uh, as of right now, there, there, there was one proposal about the hemp, the CBD processing <coughs> and the uh, investor pulled out um, and so there are no proposals on the table i have not heard about housing proposals um, it does not appear to be moving so you're saying there is a need in vermont for mental health 
So. Yeah, um, uh, I've you know actually even in here in Heartland, uh, there are folks that have uh, had really um, unfortunate experiences with our um, with our mental health facilities. There's a lack of beds uh, in general, and we have a really in, in in some cases it's the root of a lot of our issues, um, especially with uh, patients with psychosis. Yeah where it's a very cyclical process, but we don't have the resources to really um, hold on to somebody that has mental health conditions for an extended period of time where it would be helpful. And as a result, you know, they go in for a short period of time, you know, the maximum amount of time we can keep them, and then they, um, you know, and then they're out again, and it's only a matter of time, again, before they might take their meds. Um, and, and then they're back at Mount Scutney where they get referred back to the meds. So we, we really do have a crisis, uh, I would say, going on with mental health. And um, as far as I've learned, I'm not on that committee though, so. No one's just not into that. <laughs> and the other issue too is that does the state want to give up ownership? That was one of the issues with the, temp, the hemp plant is he wanted to get it for essentially nothing. And the state was looking more like, well, we'll lease it in case the state has its hundred some acres mm -hmm. surrounded by the Windsor uh, grasslands. What's that thing called? The, 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 I keep forgetting the name. The, 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 the wildlife preserve that's now Windsor grasslands, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, it's what, seven, eight hundred acres there. So mm -hmm. it's a big chunk of state owned property. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to come up with that these days. So the state may not want to give out ownership. Hmm. I wonder if it would make a, some kind of a park. Some of the just starting to be talked about Green Mountain Power projects with their battery arrays and solar. Are people considering that? Well, they did. Yeah, there was a proposal for solar, um, but they, that wasn't. That didn't fly for some reason. But it, that, it got halved or something. The, like the that. neighbors just they love that. Well, it's a beautiful piece of property. Sure they did is, not yeah. want to look at solar. Yeah. There was going to be a huge solar array, and that part is now not on the prison property. It's part of the wildlife management area. Yeah. So, what's left from the on the the uh, buildings and grounds owns the 116 acres or something that's left. That's the where the prison sits right now. Mm -hmm. So, how about um, Emerald Dashboard? You need money. Um, I did share with Dave uh, a grant, but it's not a uh, our municipal manager. Um, it's not available to us. It's a small planning grant. Um, I believe we're going to hear about Emerald uh today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as I was told by our conservation commission uh, leader chair that uh, we, since we don't have Emerald Bore, we're not eligible for that grant funding. But that's just for planning. Um, I'm not aware of any state funding right now for addressing the Emerald Ash Borer. It seems to be a huge issue. Uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of the Conservation Commission, but the numbers are pretty staggering for what we're going to need to do to address it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't appear that there are really any good solutions for addressing it. Um, we're just kind of getting beyond this idea that it, we should go and cut down all of our ash trees, which of course means that we lose all of our ash trees. Um, so there's, unfortunately, there's not a lot in the works right now for Emerald Ash Board, but it is something that I have talked to our, uh, continue to talk to our um, Forks, Parks, and Rex folks about and our um, foresters. I think the most important thing is what private landowners can do with their foresters to mitigate the, um, any concerns about invasive species or plants um, because our foresters are going to be the most educated on these issues. Yeah, but we're going to have a huge bill just with the, the ash trees that are in our parkways. So I'm really happy you guys are thinking about it because it is... Well, the Conservation Commission yeah. gave a presentation. They did a study and they're on top of it. Yeah. So you've been asking us what's, what we see. What do you see, Mike? that we should be considering or thinking about as in the next session? Well, um, I can just say uh, I believe that we are going to be seeing something, I think, pretty early on about, um, although I'm not, 
I mean, it does impact our municipality, but on minimum wage um, and family leave and uh, family and medical leave assistance. Mm -hmm. um, those, the, as, I, I'm not sure the bills may change from what they were last year, um, but that could have some pretty big impacts on our businesses and mm -hmm. individuals in our district. Mm -hmm. um, those are the only and regulation in marijuana. We're not sure where that's going to go if the House and Senate would come together on that mm -hmm. and pass something that the governor would support. We also don't know in terms of the paid family leave and the minimum wage if we pass something whether it would get vetoed mm -hmm. or, or whether we'd have the votes to override if it does. Mm -hmm. um, Act 250. Those are the first things coming. Yeah, Act 250 is coming up. Big, big, big changes to Act 250. Like what? I actually don't know. I'm not on that committee. No. And it, it, it's, it hasn't come out of committee, I but see. we expect it. Um, they've been working on it all last session and probably over the summer as well. So we're not sure what the changes are going to be yet. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I think the caucus, the, the Democratic caucus, is probably going to is poised to do some more serious looking at climate issues this time around. And exactly what that will be, I'm not sure. The, the one thing um, I've heard a lot of enthusiasm for is to, you know, that the state has uh, uh, goals, climate uh, carbon carbon goals, and right now there is no obligation to do anything, they're just goals. And so there, there might be a bill to make them requirements where if, if the state doesn't do it, someone could bring a suit against the state for failing to do that. But that's one bill that I know is going to come up, whether or not it passes, don't know. And that, and that could have implications for our municipalities because... Um, uh, I was just going to bring that up. I'm sure you'll get an earful from the LCT because they just love the unfunded mandates. But um, yeah, if the state just simply pushes it to the towns, that's just not a realistic alternative on behalf of the state. To, you know, they, they seem to have big ideas and they have a lot of wants. It's got to be pushed more at the state level. It can't, they can't just be delegated to the towns. But yes, yeah. I don't think it can. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Well, because each town has a responsibility through the comprehensive energy plan, and right now our energy committee is dealing with our enhanced energy plan to, for solar and renewable energy siting. Um, but each town has to is obligated to contribute towards those standards. So if, you're right. If we're if we're making that a mandate and not providing funding, I think what the state needs to understand is is the ability of some of these medium to smaller towns to actually. I mean, just come back to the road standards that you guys pass. You know, and then if you get into climate change or other things, you know, the resources that these towns have are from somewhat minimal. So I think that that gets lost in the in the hallways of the. Uh, legislature at times, and, and again, I'm going to come back with some of these grander ideas, which are good, but when it comes to implementation, I don't think that's always thought through. So that's just my. I know you'll hear more of that, but that's. Well, so what I'm hearing answer. you say is, as we move forward, make sure that we look carefully at the obligations that the towns are going to have, and the ability for that to actually to, to truly be successfully carried out, or whether it's just kind of a more of a grander idea than it is mm -hmm. implementation wise. Yeah. Well, and that's what they, because we become liable to lawsuits and the, and the suit becomes less, I mean, the state becomes liable to lawsuits, that gives us a little bit of encouragement to, you know, actually make this something we can achieve as opposed to, um, you know, um, something just, on paper. Just Lake Champlain comes to mind and, and <laughs> the state's inability to grasp its own responsibilities that I, you know, we to. figured it out this year. Every single election has a price tag on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and and unlike some towns, we don't have a, a, a large commercial base to help us. So, you know, we might have the same population as a neighboring town, but they have a lot of businesses and we don't. And that makes a huge difference, right? And yeah, the state, we don't have a big tax base, so it's hard to come up find Very few people say that they would like their taxes to go up. There are a few that I've encountered, but most people don't want their taxes higher. Really? What a surprise. <laughs> so I'm on, the, uh, I'm on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee, 
Um, when I am working on things on the committee, I'm oftentimes thinking about Windsor because there is a commercial base there um, that we can help, uh, that we can incent, we can, you know, we're talking about new worker programs. Um, I mean, we, we, we created a new worker program uh, that's not just remote workers. Um, but I oftentimes, am, what can I do for Heartland? Because we don't we, have. We could run the Windsor uh, septic and water up through uh, along the railroad track to our little industrial area, and that could invite more businesses to be growing in what our town plan calls for a business area. So, uh, is that a state thing, or is that something that the select board would do? Would work out with with Windsor to to move? Because I think West Windsor had. They work through the Windsor Select Board to bring um, sewage up to them. Yeah, I, I don't know, Zach. I don't, We're I looking don't know for the capacity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you have any idea what Windsor's. I, I was told they had the capacity. They definitely have the capacity. Yeah, they do have yeah. the capacity. Because yeah. they, were, they were used to <clears throat> their two, you know, Goodyear and, right. and they've lost part of it. But I, again, where would that money come from? Right. Windsor. <laughs> Windsor. <No. laughs> I don't think so. I, I, I don't know, but from a a growth perspective, and that's an opportunity for yeah. Heartland to follow the town plan and um, and benefit Windsor if they have excess capacity. You know, the trick is building it. Yeah. So they have an anaerobic digester, so that's not currently generating energy to even um, fulfill the needs of the wastewater treatment facility. So if they had more capacity, they could actually. Yeah, it, it could generate enough electricity that they may not even have operating costs. They have an anaerobic digester? Yeah, yeah, which is that uh, cool. <coughs> why, why aren't they using it? Uh, they don't have enough capacity. That uh, they need. Oh. To, you need to have a certain amount of um, oh. yeah volume oh. to, to to make it function. I just had one more question. Uh, John and I, John and I talked to the sheriff, uh, the police chief of Windsor, and. Um, and I was curious if the town had considered, when speaking to him, it was, uh, you know, with Windsor just, uh, they, they now contract with the, the Windsor Police Department. And we were looking at some of the numbers, and I know Heartland Elementary just was, um, has hired a resource officer, which is from the Police Department. Um, this is not our place at all, but I was just curious, you know, from his conversation, he talked about how all the benefits that could potentially come from if Heartland contracted with the Windsor Police Department. Again, this is not my place at all. I'm asking out of curiosity, as a, actually as a Heartland resident, if that was something that you thought the town would be interested in, or the select board. Well, it, it does involve us in the in the piece that the state police really don't want to keep doing it. They don't they know, know, the love to not have to take care of these towns anymore. Well, according to the state police, it's pressure from the state legislature that is cutting back their funding. So this circle just continues here. I mean, we've met with Colonel, I forget his name, the head of the state police, and they basically said their mandate was to change the way they operate because of lack of funding coming their way. Well, that, I, I, that, I haven't heard that. I mean. Part of the funding that they use comes from the towns that contract with them. Right. So it should be an even kind of thing. Well, they were, he, he told us that there was a mandate that local communities should do their own policing and the state police should just do the higher level investigative pieces. I'll look into that and see how accurate that is. Okay. Answer your question, John. We've already done that. We've already considered. Iron Windsor, uh, not seriously, but we, we talked about it more than once. Yeah. And uh, we have to remember that Windsor is trying to sell their services. I mean, obviously, um, it's not it's not too far fetched. It's a possibility. We haven't we never ruled it out. It's just hasn't happened. And we're happy with the state police, so <clears throat> that's where we are. I'll look into the Yeah, state I didn't give you his name. I have a I know exactly where the business card is. Birmingham. Birmingham, yeah. It's actually from Windsor originally. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, like you for it. It. Like we said at the beginning, there's a bill deadline. So if if you do have an idea something, yeah. of something yeah. that we could that needs to be introduced to deal with some yeah. specific problem, let us know soon. Money. 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 Well, I get right on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you. Sorry right. for the work you guys do too. Thank you. go next, but I think we'll go to the Conservation Commission and uh, talk about the Emerald Ash Borer. Okay. Um, so the last time I was here, we talked about the Emerald Ash Borer. There have been a couple of things that have happened since. Um, the Conservation Commission has developed a response plan, which basically outlines the things that we're going to be working on in regard to the borer. Um, and I circulated that to you guys, so you should have a copy of that. If there are any questions about that, I'm happy to address those. Uh, I also wanted to put up, uh, pass out some of these maps. This is where the border is currently in Vermont, um, which is significantly more than where it was the last time I talked to you. Um, and I think the most disturbing thing about this is if you compare the way the distribution is growing in Vermont to how it is growing in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, about five or six years ago, it started out as a little dot around Concord. And since then, it's just grown a little bit larger each year from that dot. But in Vermont, we had it in February of 2018 was the first of these spots. And instead of growing out from that spot in a sort of a gradual, consistent manner, it just pops up all over the place, which I think tells us that this is people driving around with infested firewood and just um, rediscover it two years later. And it's already probably much more widespread even than this. So the most recent place that it was discovered was in Londonderry. And if you go from the little red dots on your map there are the places where they've had a confirmed sighting of the beetle or a tree that's infested. Uh, the yellow areas are a five mile radius around that that they call their high risk area. That means the beetle is probably there already and they just don't know it. But the nearest, um, if you look at the Londonderry Circle, that's about 25 miles from Harland. So I would not, I think that the time frame for when it's going to get here is probably a lot quicker than we had hoped. Um, so the Conservation Commission's efforts are in three areas. We are continuing to survey to find out where the ash trees are, particularly along busy roads. Um, we're looking at village centers and places that the ash trees might um, pose a, a hazard, like over at the Martinsville Covered Bridge. There are about a half a dozen ash trees that, if they died and fell, could easily hit the bridge. So that might be something we want to pay attention to sooner rather than later. Um, we're also looking, uh, we're working with Two Rivers to map where the ash trees are because we have lots of roads, we have lots of ash trees, we have lots of cars, but the only problem is where you have cars and ash trees on the roads at the same time. And so we're trying to focus our attention on the more well-traveled roads and try and figure out where the ashes are on those trees. So um, I'm hoping that Two Rivers will be able to help us draw some density maps that uh, tell us where the hot spots are going to be. I can tell you right now, one is at the corner where Clay Hill Road and Queechee uh, Hartman Road come together. Mm -hmm. 
there's a ton. We counted in one survey something like 78 ash trees in a two-tenth mile stretch of that road. So I think that our original estimates uh, when we did the survey before the last time I came and talked to you, I think those uh, estimates are probably low. At that point, we were guessing 45 ash trees a mile, and based on our more recent surveying, I would think it might be closer to 60 a mile. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, the other things we're doing are we're trying to educate people. Uh, we have on Thursday of this week, the county forester is coming here to Damon Hall and she's going to do a presentation for landowners on Emerald Ash Borer. Um, there was an earlier one, a presentation here for municipal people that I think most of you were, were at. Um, so we're trying to, and our, our uh, old home days booth, one of the big emphasis there was trying to get people information about the border. So we're doing what we can. Um, the other thing we're doing is just trying to monitor, uh, see if the trees are um, looking healthy or looking bad. Uh, when I sent out the listserv announcement about Hannah's talk, a couple of people got back to me and said, oh, on my 16 acres, every ash tree has emerald ash borer. And that's right here in town. Now, I, maybe they don't, maybe it's ash yellows or some other ash disease, but you know, we need to check those things out and make sure. So um, that's something else we're trying to work on, is just monitoring the health of the, the ash trees in town and see um, that, uh, if there are borers, we find them sooner rather than later. And then the last thing is just to encourage you guys to think about a plan of your own for how to deal with the borer, because there are a couple of things. One, one I think we could do right away is to try and clear some of the backlog of dead trees that exist now, ash or not ash, um, because as these ashes die, we're gonna have an increasing burden of dead trees and if we can clear the ones that we have now out of the way that are, could potentially be hazards, that would, be, that would help down the road. It would help spread the cost over a longer period of time. Um, the other thing we might want to look at is some preemptive cutting. The last time I was here, I said, oh no, we never want to cut an ash tree that's not sick. But if you look at the Martinsville Bridge situation, we may not want to wait until the trees are dead and fall on the bridge before we <coughs> decide to cut them. Um, and we'll try and let you know where we think there are trees that could be problematic and you can make that decision on your own. But um, it probably will cost money. Taking down these trees is expensive. And our current tree budget, tree cutting budget, is woefully inadequate even for the trees that we have now. So, that's the good news. <laughs> Rob, do you see any change with uh, something which I'm, I'm not a fan of, but uh, the commitment to using pesticides to save the trees that are healthy now? Um, yeah, there, um, there are pesticide treatments that you can inject into the tree. Once you start it, you have to continue it for the life of the tree. Right. And so there's an ongoing expense there. Um, it's something that if we had ash trees that were of great <coughs> cultural historical significance, we might want to think about. But I think for trees in general, it's just too expensive to, yeah, I agree. to chase down that road. Yeah, I, you know, had mentioned to, to the, your group, um, I did discover that uh, some towns in New Jersey are saving the historically significant sites where ash trees are, you know, George Washington's plant and something. Uh, but that the other um, use of pesticides are by private landowners wanting to save the vegetation on the property. Well, do you, during your workshops, will you be addressing that? <coughs> we'll certainly mention it as a possibility um, that, that landowners should consider. 
But if you're doing a woodlot, it's, you know, there's no way to do that. I agree. But if, if there's an ash tree that might fall on your house, that might be something worth thinking yeah. about doing to try and rescue it. <laughs> I think you mentioned, though, that the success rate isn't great. It, it, it's not. Uh, Even uh, with that. That's it's, and and uh, it's either because they're starting too late or they're not keeping up the practice. Um, and, and some of the, uh, the professors at Rutgers University, which are in the thick of this, are still debating what the causes of it not working are. Well, Knox mentioned that there was a, uh, there was a possibility that the, there's a fungus that gets into the bug and can kill the beetles. Um, so there are some biological controls that are being explored. I think there's a wasp that they're looking at, but those are a ways off. I don't think that that's going to help us, actually. This is scary. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of questions. Um, <laughs> you mentioned someone who's got uh, all the ash trees to die, and they think they've already got the. Is someone going there to? Yes. To look at that. Yeah, I was going to talk to Hannah about that, um, and see if she can go. Or I mentioned to this guy that he might get in touch with Bill Stack, or okay. another forester. Sure. Okay. And my other question is: have, Do you know of? We have, we have about 75 miles of back roads. Of course, that includes the, the like the Queechee Road, paved roads. But um, how much of that roadway has Green Mountain Power Lines on it? Do you know that? I don't know that, and that's a good point. <clears throat> Green Mountain Power's plan for responding to the borer is that in all of those areas that are yellow on your map, either red or yellow, they're going to go in and preemptively cut every ash tree in the power line. Um, at least that was their plan a year ago. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at how that map has expanded, I, you know, that's not going to happen easily. No. But um, as it comes, if, if, as soon as we get in one of those high-risk areas, I think that Green Mountain Power may come in and start cutting on their right of ways. But, when they established a fund that they were trying to, they were going to either have an extra account. It's on the electric bill already. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that, and I can't. Well, I'm just thinking it would oh. lessen less out the tenant's uh, responsibility for getting rid of the trees. If yeah, when we when we've been doing some surveying, we sometimes look at that. And you know that might take somewhere between a third and a half of the trees that we're talking about out of the picture. <laughs> but if we've got you know 4,000 trees, 5,000 ash trees in the right of way, we're still talking about a big problem, even if mm. uh, Green Mountain Power does take those out. Yeah. What is your? I forget the estimate per tree that you have to take down. Take a tree down. Um, so. Yeah, so it depends on the size of the tree and how dead it is and a lot of stuff like that. Um, but because ash tends to be very brittle once it dies, it um, is fairly risky to take it down. The branches all start falling off on your head. Um, so the estimates that I've seen range from maybe $500 a tree up to $3,500 a tree. Well, we're going to have to do better than that. We yeah. don't have that much money. Well, right, and I don't think we have to take down every tree because some of them will fall away from the road and some of them you know, are not going to be an issue. But I think that even if only 10% of the trees are a problem, that's still a big problem. So. Could we top them? No? Just, just so that when they fall, they won't fall into the road, but not take down. Well, you'd have to come in with a bucket or something. And, um, I guess if, if the tree's not dead, if you could have somebody climb up and pop it. But once it's dead, that's too risky. You'd have to go in with a bucket to do it, I think. I'm thinking that when they, when we know that the beetle's in the tree, and the tree's still solid, it needs to be fallen. 
It, it needs to be. Uh, it needs to be falling away from the road, <coughs> and that might be the only thing you do. But you need to at least do that step. Right. How long does it take to kill the tree? Two to five years from when it gets infected, infested to when it's yeah. dead. It's, it's also hard to even know that it's infected for the first yeah. three years. Oh, wow. It's quite likely you don't even know it. Yeah. It's right. happening. It's, it's true that they're attacking the top of the tree. Okay, yeah, you can't see the, yeah, so the little holes are <coughs> sort of distinctly shaped where the larva comes out, of. but those are generally up at the top of the tree and you can't see them. Yeah. And so the only way you can tell the tree is dying is because the crown starts to die back. Yeah. And that can be you know, two years after it gets infested anyway. So by that time it's too late to save the tree, but you might be able to knock it down. I was looking at a tree uh, yesterday in the churchyard in Four Corners. It's a box elder tree, base about this big. It's girdled by mice because there was a pile of bees around. It's about that much live wood. So it doesn't take much to keep a tree alive. In other words, if if these uh, emerald ash borers have infested the tree, if there's some pathways the sap to go in, it's going to stay alive and look fairly good you know, for quite a while. So it, it's just hard to see it until it's almost done. <laughs> there, there are a few clues that you can tell for when a tree is infested or has a problem oh, yeah. in that it starts sprouting from the base. Yeah. But, I mean, again, that can, that, that can be a lot of causes of that. Yeah. And it may not hurt to help them quickly. Yeah, if it gets, if it gets a lot of ores, then the woodpeckers will start working on it. You can see those spots on the tree. Yeah, it's not a good thing. Well, the, the other liability that Greg Chase mentioned when he, uh, not necessarily, not directly related to taking ash trees down, but just when they start <coughs> mentioned when they get brittle and they start falling off, he's taken a couple of guys to the hospital with, you know, broken shoulders and stuff from limbs falling down. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, then you get the liability of that. So for whoever's taking them down whether it's a town worker or what. Yeah, I, that I understand. Yeah, you're, right. you're absolutely right. It's better to deal with it. It's still flexible. It still uh, hasn't dried out yet. It's time to rot. Question? I called VTC and I talked to their forestry. They have a new forestry program up there. And I said, you know, you guys ought to put, build into your forestry program how to cut down dead ash trees because this is a problem that's going to be in the state for 20 or 30 years. And if you're training people how to do this correctly, you, you know, they're going to have a, a market. And they were interested in that. I don't know that anything will actually come of it, but at least yeah. it's planting a seed, hmm. so to speak. <laughs> that's depressing. Ah, uh, no, come on. <laughs> Life is not a marriage. I agree, it is depressing. <laughs> Between the actual death of these beautiful trees and the cost to remove them, and it's... Well, something we really should think about is, isn't there something we could do with the wood? I mean, we could probably provide wood for everybody in town that burns wood, you know, just give them free firewood to burn it up. If there was a way logistically that we could get the trees yeah. to the place that they need to go and get them, you know, somebody would be willing to cut those up for. Well, I've certainly been watching the biomass project at Dartmouth and the timber company that's already in town. Uh, they were set to provide the biomass for that plant. 
And I thought, there's the perfect match for use in town, but I think that's going up in smoke. <laughs> okay. Maybe we should stop. Tomorrow, 6.30. Any other comments? I think the only comment that Knox and I went to the one of the uh, state-run uh, talks about the Emerald Ashbor, and the, the bottom line that I took away was the plan ahead, that the most expensive way to deal with it is to not do anything. Mm -hmm. So when they're talking about, you know, establishing stump dumps or how to deal with it or trying to incorporate it into a plan now before it hits. <coughs> Is the uh, CATV off the agenda yeah, for tonight? Okay. No. okay. Uh, yeah. So, well, we can do the Fogbrook Road thing, I guess, first. Yeah. So, Ralph, you're here. Uh, we'll listen to whatever you have to say. We got. Uh, I think we all have some thoughts about this too, and we can discuss it. So. Are you referring to me? I am. Okay, Wes Johnson. Oh, excuse me. That's all right. <laughs> I knew you were Wes, but I... That's okay, I have been called a lot Yeah. Uh, I did receive a letter of concern regarding Fort Brook Road from the town. Uh, uh, Dave Ormiston uh, sent the October 15th letter, and uh, they're concerned about the uh, grade of the road, Fort Brook Road, exceeding uh, uh, the 8% that uh, is... Uh, Part of the policy, and some places it's close to 16 percent. So, uh, uh, rather than belabor a lot of different things, uh, I'll just speak right to that point, which has been brought up. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the select board for uh, this opportunity to speak. I also want to thank the town for the satellite source uh, elevation printout of Fort Brook Road, um, and uh, which measures the actual. Uh, length of the road as well as uh, at 100 point 100 foot increments um, uh, the uh, the height and the elevation so that's a very precise thing so but uh, since I'm retired I have a lot of time in my hands I went out with a, a laser level that I have and a, um, a wheel marker and I just sort of did some random marking and and it's really amazing what you can do from a satellite it's just absolutely accurate so I I commend uh, that uh, resource, um, and um, and it certainly is accurate. So I cannot contest what the finding is. Um, what's unfortunate is my laser level and the satellite was not available in 1982 when this policy came up. We were dealing with the National Geographic. Uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, the uh, Geological um, maps that uh, existed, and um, they were uh, Department of Interior Geological Survey maps, and these were pretty coarse by comparison to that satellite. And uh, before I bought the property, I did uh, purchase a couple of these maps to uh, get an idea of what I was getting into. Because when I bought the property, it was uh, eight feet of snow on the ground. So, uh, but. Uh, the worst that could happen is the trees would be taller. Um, so um, in the winter of 1978, um, we were showed the property by Margaret Remington. And uh, uh, I parked, uh, well, actually, after passing Jim Blake's property uh, uh, that he rented from um, Roger Potwin, uh, I parked uh, in front of um, uh, Jack and Judith Sears Hall and then proceeded to see our property. So this is all 1978, four years before the policy. Um, 
after agreeing upon a um, purchase price, um, I engaged uh, Paul Borden and uh, he proceeded with uh, a warranty deed, looking back into any Native American claim. Um, that was quite popular back in 78. A lot of the casinos in Connecticut were mm -hmm. um, uh, developed because of the American Indian claim that they own property and I don't want to be part of that purchase. Um, he also uh, looked over specifics for establishing the right of way that existed on a map but it was not surveyed. Um, just prior to my 27th birthday, on May 1st, 1978, um, I purchased the property. I also asked my wife to marry me. <laughs> so I have a definitely a good memory of when I bought the property. Um, I also uh, stated at the closing that the, uh, I was buying my retirement home, uh, much to the amusement of all attending the closing. Uh, I like to plan ahead. At 27, I was already thinking about retiring. Um, I ended up retiring at age 52 instead. Um, after our wedding, uh, which we had our honeymoon on the property, uh, we proceeded with uh, discussing with Richard Sear um, about the right of way, and uh, he ended up selling his property, his home that we parked in front of, to his brother, Jack and Judas. A seer. Uh, they had a young boy, uh, I'm sorry, I was uh, Richard uh, Sear, uh, his wife. Uh, Richard Sear had a young boy, uh, David Sear, uh, David's house over at Dartmouth is um, uh, in memory of him from by dying of cancer. So all that is pretty much dated far before this policy. Uh, I hired Jim Blake to gravel the existing logging road so we could come and go on our property. And I asked the town for a building permit application sometime later and was told uh, there's no such thing as a building permit in town. <laughs> Which, uh, coming from Connecticut, uh, was quite a shock. Um, however, I did need to get a certificate of occupancy uh, once my septic system was approved which kind of confused me, uh, how can I live in that? But anyways, I approved, we got an approved septic system and we proceeded with a certificate of occupancy. But at that discussion in the town, they didn't mention about this policy they had to, that you had to have a certain um, road condition in order for it to be accepted. Um, but anyways, I asked what there any restrictions and none was forthcoming except for the septic tank requirement. So pursuant to provisions of subsection 43 of Title 19 of the Vermont Statutes, we request Fort Brook Road be made a Class 3 town road due to the fact that it is a highway negotiable under normal conditions all seasons of the year by a standard manufactured pleasure car of which emergency vehicles, CDL trucks, such as concrete, UPS, oil and propane delivery trucks, plus a mobile home or two have traveled over the years. We ask the board to waive the requirement of culverts shall be of corrugated steel, concrete or aluminum, and allow for plastic corrugated culverts of the design that the town presently uses. And finally, as of the elevation requirement, we ask the board to consider that enforcement of this provision would place an undue hardship on existing investments made prior to the Town of Heartland's Highway Ordinance and Culvert Policy enactment of 1982. We wish to be grandfathered prior to the requirements as to the fact existing prior to the policy. Creating a gradual winding road to elevate the inclination would impinge upon approved septic systems, Green Mountain Power underground power feed, private underground water supplies such as wells, as well as residents themselves. So with that, I close my comments and open for any questions. So can you repeat your last point there?
your last sentence or two? Oh, creating a winding road. So, it, for instance, instead of going up steeply over a short distance. And who's going to create that? If, if it was to if, become a town. If the town required to, to maintain the eight degrees, yeah. the one solution would be to create a winding serpentine, like a switchback on a right. trail type road. Okay. And with the existing homes prior to 1978 and property, uh, that was purchased prior to 19, uh, 1982, uh, that it would require uh, extensive uh, impingement on those existing structures and additional um, hardship for the residents there to, um, to move all those uh, things that would create a problem. I Wes, we were going to have a, a site visit and uh, I don't know if that was going to be today. I don't, I don't know if you, it was last that, month, and then it was post. post but we, but we uh, <coughs> having seen the, um, you know, got the information that you mentioned tonight. Uh, we decided that we would at least postpone that. So we, we didn't do that, and uh, we have. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a number of things that you pro your road probably doesn't besides the grade. Culverts have to be a certain diameter. Um, is it 18 inches? 15 to 18. 15 to 18, yeah. So maybe if there were 15, they would be big enough. Uh, we require a certain width of the road, uh, which you probably don't need. Uh, we also require uh, ditches, um, and we require a certain base on the road, depth of base. Um, we've been installing uh, we've done about a mile, is it, of stone line ditches, or is it? Just this year. This year. So that that also would be a requirement, because that road is, is so steep uh, that we would have to have, you, you, that's something we, you would have to do before we would take it on, would be stone line ditches. But this, this, it's not just the grade. There's a number of things that, that we are not meeting the standards. Well, I can appreciate um, the need for that. Uh, this past storm we've had, um, I'm sure there are many town roads that were badly eroded. Mm. Uh, we can go up there now and you can see Fort Brook Road has not had any maintenance done because none was needed. There was no erosion with this heavy rain we had just the other day. Uh, as far as digging up the road and to prove what the base is, uh, over the past 41 years that I've been there, uh, I put in several thousand dollars to uh, maintain it and to improve it uh, and to have, have other people be able to travel over it. Um, as far as the size of the culverts, uh, I, I thought I read it was 10 inches, but I could be wrong. It's, uh, my grandchildren tell me I'm wrong quite often. <laughs> um, but uh, with, with all of that, um, certainly, if we can reach a compromise on where the town has allowed in the um, uh, policy, um, uh, in cases of unusual hardship or unique circumstances, the select board may modify these specifications. And I appreciate also, however, any modification shall be the minimum change necessary. So if a site visit was helpful to determine what the town would require uh, for the residents of Fort Worth Road to, to meet a um, compromise, uh, I can present it to everybody there and see what they can do. Um, well, um, the grade is really a serious problem. And, you know, a reasonable compromise would be if you had a section of the road that was 10%, when we ask for eight, that would be a reasonable compromise. But having several sections that are 16% is, I don't know, I don't see how we can make that into a reasonable compromise. Um, yeah. Now, how about the culverts? Uh, it stated firmly that the culverts have to be aluminum or galvanized. No, I don't. And, but, can I interrupt for just a second? Certainly, absolutely. So the second part of this is the state standards the town has adopted. Mm -hmm. And the state standards, in order for the town to take on any kind of a new road, it also needs to live up to the state standards as well. 
which also clarifies the 15 to an 18 inch culvert, um, which can also be plastic. So you also need to live up to the state standards as well as the town <coughs> standards here. The two are somewhat married uh, and the town has signed that and has adopted that, so that's a part of it as well. Okay, I, then, then listen to, we'll see if I'm understanding properly that the um, town is going to require us to put in concrete or galvanized culverts? Did I just say that? I, I'm sorry. No. I don't think I just said that. So what I said was is that the town has adopted state bridge and road standards, mm -hmm. okay? And as a part of adopting those road and bridge standards, it outlines, so the town cannot take on a new road unless it lives up to those standards as well. Mm -hmm. And in that, it outlines it needs to be 15 to 18 inch culverts and plastic, or it can be plastic. So you're not just bound by a 12 inch steel culvert, you're also bound by the town, by the state road and bridge standards of which I can get into as well, um, if you'd like. Dave, if I explain to the, about the FEMA, the FEMA thing, I mean, we have to, if we don't, we don't live up to the standards, then when we have an event and the road washes out, you can't apply to FEMA for aid if we have been negligent in, in taking care of the road. So we have to, we have to, Whenever we do something to a road or take on a road is, is a thing. We have to do it right or else we're at the creek. Mm -hmm. so. So, so every road since 1982 that the town has taken on as a town road, this is then not, that has met these standards. <clears throat> that is not true. We have, we have uh, taken, I know of two particular roads that we took on uh, within the last uh, 15 years that do not meet the standard that, we, that we're talking about here. There's a steep road on, off, it goes off Rice Road that has a steep section on it. It's not, it's not a long section, but it's considerably more than 8% grade. And then there's a road off uh, on Mount Hunger Road, which we took on, which has also got um, a section that's greater than 8 so we consider those errors in our judgment. And we don't want to do it again. Well, it's in addition to the culverts, the state also have very specific outlines for the ditches that are involved. And when you get to the grade that we're talking about here, it's, it's very elaborate. So it's not just the culverts. Sure. Uh, there's, there's, uh, and it, and it is true, there are a lot of town roads that, that far exceed 8% in sections. That doesn't mean we want more of them. I hope you can understand that. Well, I, I certainly understand, and I don't want, maybe this isn't the, the time to fully discuss yeah. uh, it. And I can appreciate not absorbing a lot of the time available tonight on this. And so, um, it, uh, where are we now? Is that you will visit Fort Brook Road personally, or that you're going to uh, basically, based on the steepness of the road and the assumption that the culverts and the ditches don't meet standards, that you'll deny the request? Or where, where are we on this? Well, if, if it was only the ditches and the culverts, we know that if you really wanted the road taken on, that you would fix them. But the problem is you can't fix the grade. Uh, so where are we? Um, I think maybe we have to discuss that. So Wes, let me also just clear. So in this, what we do do as we go along, such as we did it on Advent Hill Road just this past um, April when we had rain events. So anytime, so presently, for instance, there are 15 inch culverts in town roads. So anytime we go through and upgrade, so for instance, we just did significant amount of work on Webster Road, okay? All those culverts that we came across were upsized to an 18 inch, okay? 
anything that we just did on um, Mace Hill, we just did significant ditching there, was upsized to an 18 inch. Um, and a driveway culvert was um, the property owner. We needed to upsize that to a 15 inch as we went along. Um, it actually, in this year's road and bridge standards, doesn't specify metal or plastic. Um, it can be either, but it needs to be a minimum of an 18 inch culvert. And driveway culverts need to be 15 inch or upwards to an 18 inch culvert is recommended. Well, I have a five foot culvert for my, because <laughs> of the stream involved. Right, but just again, just to come back to our dialogue there, and as, as the town signs this, it's kind of an overlay to the, the standards that you saw here on the 10 points. So you kind of put these together. When we sign this, we agree with the state of Vermont that anything that we take on will also include these standards here as well. So it's almost like an overlay between the two. Um, ours does talk about drainage and ditching and all that stuff, but as Phil and, and Gordon pointed out, the state standards get very much more specific and talk about seven inch stone on an 18, on an 8% um, incline or, or something to that extent, which does come into play here as well. But, um, well, I, I, would it be possible for guidance from the town that uh, if, if Norfolk Road's request is uh, rejected, then could a shopping list come up with the town for us to uh, achieve in order for being compliance? So I need to go back to the uh, uh, people. We got uh, two people on. Um, uh, well, actually, three people on oxygen right now. One uh, a couple of people with cancer. One person just died. So I'm trying to get back to these people so that we have some kind of dialogue. Uh, they're not able to attend tonight, and um, it would be certainly uh, helpful for for them to be able to digest really where we where we need to be. I I can provide a lot of the skill and labor with my machinery to achieve some of this. Uh, and it would be at their expense to provide the materials. So uh, if we have a shopping list to, uh, to achieve what the town expects of us, and if we need to uh, grade the road by cutting into ledge and blasting and stuff, that should be included in the cost too. I think the standards are out there. It's not a matter of us you know, having to supply them. They're public documents and we can point them toward them. So we should shoot for 8% to eight percent over the entire rise there then? Because you mentioned about 10%. So this is why I, if, if a site visit was held by the town and say, look at, uh, this is what we need from you, uh, besides just referring back to a somewhat flexible standards here from uh, history, uh, that, you know, it would be very helpful for me to uh, to start a dialogue with the the, uh, the residents there. The site visit is, and, and this is for the board and for Wes. The site visit is um, a formal move forward and kind of notification to the town that you're taking on this road, uh, and it's a chance for someone, as a neighbor or somebody else, to speak against that. Um, the language in your policy or ordinance is that they are to, that the conditions, um, it's agreed upon that the conditions have been met. And once that they have been met, then a site visit that occurs. Um, in my understanding of this, there was feedback from the board that based upon a 16% slope, which is double the 8% slope, that Clearly, it did not meet the standards um, of of the of the policy, and that that alone was somewhat of a you know s signal that um, you know that this doesn't meet, and that there was therefore at that point it was a clear feedback from the board that based upon the 16% slope that that clearly didn't meet, and therefore a site visit was was unnecessary based upon right. that. I think, I, you know. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. Jim used to talk about that. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> oh, it's kind of where we are. OK. 
Okay, so uh, do I understand, and once again, I apologize if I do misunderstand what's going on. Uh, this is my first time I've done this. Um, that the town is rejecting our request, and it's based on the fact that Forkwood Road doesn't meet the guidelines of the policy. No, I guess that's right. Okay. I think that a motion and a uh, vote would be certainly um, would be needed here. Um, he's, there's been a, an open request to the board. Uh, I think the board needs to act officially, you know, in some sort of a capacity and provide a reason for, you know, you know, your motion yeah, to go from there. Okay, so, so I make the motion that the board uh, reject Mr. Johnson's uh, application to have Fort Brook Road taken over as a town road based on its failure. Failure, thank you. Failure to meet uh, state and town road guidelines. Does that work? Standards, I think. Standards? Yeah. And um, specifically? Spe okay, specifically the 16%. Are you writing this down? Yes and, and okay. no. I'm trying to guide you on your motion. Okay, and okay. I'll well, you up on specifics. Uh, okay. <laughs> specifically the 16% grade in parts of the road. I'll second the motion. Thoughts, further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. I guess that's that. Thank you for your time and your consideration. You're welcome. talk about though the uh, you Mary you brought up the uh, lack of stop signs at the end of Gilson Road and Grout Road is it both ends of Grout Road or just the five this is what somebody else asked me to bring up yeah and they, I think they just said one and where the, what, the Heartland Quichi Road and right you, you mentioned the Heartland Quichi Road and those roads yeah uh, yeah this is where they intersect. So Davis, Davis looked it up. And who's 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 seconded? Thank you. Dave, Dave looked it up. Those those roads are supposed to have uh, yield signs. Oh, and, okay. And may it could be that the yield signs uh, disappear. I I um, just actually rode my bike the other day after that Mary brought that in. Um, Grout has does not have a sign or a post on either either end. Either end. Okay. Um, so um, and, uh, is that is that right? Grout's supposed to have. So a Grout sign. does not have, uh, due to the ordinance that you've had in effect since for a while, and it's been revised five times or so. Um, does not have one uh, a stop or a yield at Grout and Clay Hill. Uh, Grout and Queechee has a yield, it's supposed to have a yield, oh, okay. and um, I thought I've been looking at the stop sign, but Gilson and Queechee are supposed to have a yield. I can't remember, does Gilson fork out in a Y as it means? It does, yes. yes. So yeah. does that mean one turn of the is pretty hairy? Does that, would, would that mean it needs two? Two signs, or or isn't that 
is it that much of a thing? I don't know how it's. Um, I spoke to Bill about this. Apparently, the one, I mean, they both can have yields, um, probably should. I believe that just the one veering to the right towards Quichi has had a sum in the past. Well, so they've so. had yield signs before, so but they're not there currently. Uh, I can only speak for Grout. Except for the Clay Hill end, it doesn't yep. have any signs. The Clay Hill end of Grout Road does not have yield or stop. Okay, but in our ordinance. Uh, okay, but I was specifically asking about the Queechee Road end. Okay. So, are those signs there? I've been looked. Are the so, yield signs there? Uh, neither one, there's a, to my understanding, there's a sign on either one at this point in time. So, the ordinance states that it should be a yield sign. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Bill and I were both, we both started to embark down the road with stop signs because we thought that that's what should be there, but we pulled this out and it's actually yield signs. So before we proceeded with the yield signs, oh. I just wanted to ensure that. Oh. Otherwise, we need to change yeah. the ordinance, which is kind of a, pro a little bit of a process. So I just wanted to make sure we didn't want to open up the ordinance again and change I, it. I don't have an time. opinion on it. I don't okay. travel there very often, so I haven't noticed it myself. I don't know, do either of you? I, I think a yield sign would be adequate. So do I. Yeah, what is the really big difference? You hate most stop people, signs. I hate stop signs, but most people <laughs> yield at stop signs. That's right. Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. Even okay. They're supposed to stop. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know. I would think that would be, uh, for the time being, okay. be quite adequate to uh, make sure we have the right things for yeah. the audience. Okay. Fine. We can visit again later. The proof's problematic. Yeah. Okay. So how about the other thing, which was the statue, Washington oh. statue? I don't have an opinion on that. It's, <laughs> that one's it, up to you guys. It's pretty dark. I, I, I didn't go up to look at it very closely, but I do have experience, and it's tricky business to wash soft stone like that. Well, yeah, but if you don't address it, the damage can occur. So, yes, 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 yes. Did somebody volunteer to... There was sorry. somebody who volunteered who, and I've got his name at my office at a meeting, yes. Yeah, are they volunteering to do it for... Um, He's a professional, though. But does he want to get paid? Well, if he's volunteering, no. Okay. I mean, what inherent if, in the word volunteer I, is yeah. no yeah. pay. Yeah. Uh, I, I would my mind. like to see the, uh, what's the official term for looking at the products they're going to use uh, you know, to make sure that we're aware of what they're yeah, planning yeah, to yeah. use to do that cleaning. Yeah, okay. But is it is a consensus that a, we could focus on that and get it done? Yeah, okay. I, I just again, I would want to make sure this person's credentials are. This is not Agreed. the first statue they clean. Uh, Agree. Yes, yes, because they could do more damage. Yes. Yeah. Then. Yeah. What are they cleaning? The right here, the statue. Oh, oh the statue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah you did, did we even brush, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a name? I'm sorry. Did you have a name? Yeah, but I can't remember it. So it's just your. Discussing a volunteer, just a volunteer to clean the well, statue. Well, I mean, actually, I would rather pay a professional. I think this guy is a professional who lives in town and volunteered, but you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, pursue that. Okay. Find out what his credentials are. All right. Good way to go. Did I just volunteer to do that? I guess so. Like it. Well, the Board of Civil Authority meetings are over, so I got lots of free time. <laughs> Just a little bit. Okay. Okay. progress here?
Uh, Certainly. Just, I got confused in a conversation before about what's the intersection? Where is it located about when you're having a discussion about the stop sign or the yield sign? At the end of Gilson Road as it comes on to Cucci Road. Oh, okay. And All the right. end of Grout Road as it comes on to Cucci Road. Cucci Road. Okay, so we got something to sign for the intent on the creature on the three corners intersection. So you don't actually need to sign it. Oh. Uh, what I need is a motion to okay. readopt. Okay, because Clyde signed it. But, right. um, Clyde signed it before. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it has an amount in it. And are we comfortable with that amount? Because we don't know if the if a bond's going to happen and or something with the burying of the utilities is going to happen. So I spoke to the lawyer about this. I am, uh, even though if the utilities were involved, you're talking about a million dollar project. Uh, it's my understanding that by with the amount, in this case it's 450,000 was, when we were talking about this is just the intersection project. Uh, in my mind, is okay. I mean, you can we can readopt it in the amount of a million dollars if we'd like. But for everybody's, including those in the audience, the reason to for this is it allows the town, if it were to borrow uh, for this project, mm -hmm. money spent since we adopted this, which was January of 2018, I believe, <coughs> money that has been spent, and we have spent money on engineering, would be allowed to be a part of that borrowing. Okay. The work, all the engineering that we did before we signed this letter of intent, um, we can't pull into the borrowing. Um, so at this point, we'll stick with the original plan, which was to borrow from the capital projects fund. Mm -hmm. But if we had done it, you know, two years earlier, we could have pulled, you know, we could have pulled that into the borrowing. And um, as, I, as I read it, there was something about three year time limit. What does that mean? Uh, there is a time limit, but we are uh, by readopt. My understanding is by readopting this, um, we're essentially kicking it. We're, we're, we're um, yes, and he seemed to think that um, we didn't need to sign a whole new one. That we could we could make the motion and readopt, um, and that was sufficient. So, give me a moment. I don't okay. have mine, and for some reason, we're looking for a motion. Yeah, but he's looking for something. Are you looking for something? Uh, yep. So, you, if, if you have it there, Phil, you can make a motion to readopt and then the declaration of intent of the Heartland, Town of Heartland, yeah. okay. uh, in the amount of $450,000. Okay. I would make a motion that the town adopt the declaration of official intent of the Town of Heartland to reimburse certain expenditures from proceeds of indebtedness. Mm -hmm. In the amount of in the amount of four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That sound right? Yep. Okay. Well, second. Okay. Don't ask me to repeat it. <laughs> so I assume we're all in favor. Yes, I'm in favor. So that passed. Mary, you've seconded? Yes, I did. We're really busy over here today. I know. Those two yokels didn't show up, so we have to do it. Where's Mark? Oh, she and Foss. Martha went to St. Louis just for the birthday party of her oh, hundred year old aunt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I guess Mark uh, doesn't return from his hunting trip. Uh, Mad me. <coughs> I think we 
down to minutes. I mean, uh, notes, manager's notes. Uh, so a couple big things on this. Uh, it's kind of light in text, but some good, um, some big things to update you on, discuss. So I met with the folks at the Sumner Mansion, and they are open to the idea of uh, alternative two, which is to push the um, telephone pole towards the mansion, and then the north-south utilities, um, those going from Hartford to Windsor, stay on that pole and continue as they are. And the east-west, for lack of a better term, anything going towards this way would get buried. Um, there was a question due to the fact of the uh, <coughs> pole getting pushed and some uh, trees potentially being removed as to how open they would be, and they, they seem pretty open to it. Um, I think that um, in discussions with him and loud motorcycles racing past and et cetera, I think he would, sounds kind of excited at the four way stop there. So, um, <laughs> and it being a green spot. So um, he's interested in both, but uh, if it were to be a plan B, we do need to mitigate, uh, he and particularly his wife are partial to two trees on that property and we would need to work around that. I think that's possible. So um, in discussions with the engineering. So we will, uh, we had kind of held off on some of the detailed drawings on plan B there. So they will push that forward and we will proceed with that. Do we know where those are coming up exactly? We do, right? Uh, where, the, where they'll come up. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if it's plan B, it'll come up over here uh, at 11 route 12, and we would probably need to work with them and gain an easement for that. Uh, otherwise, if they don't agree, we would need to push it back towards the bank um, and come up at that pole there. Uh, and if it was the complete burial, same thing is true, but it would come up there's a pole that goes from this pole here, the big one, out towards the library driveway. Yep. It would come up towards the library driveway. Those are the only two places it would come up? Well, if... I thought there was one up here. Plan A, and they all come out of the ground by the library pole. There may be too many coming out of the ground. They may have to go to two poles. They will have to have two poles yep. by the library. Yeah. yeah. And but also out here, no? Um, yep. Probably. And, was, and then there would also be one down by the station road, too. Same thing, two poles. Yeah. And whose property is that? In front of? It's in the right of way. That one there. I know, but well, that's, that's um, before you get to station road, isn't it? It's a little right after station road, actually. You mean I think. north of station? Oh, okay. Uh, there's one south of Station Road, I think. Uh, and there's a telephone pole out by Mr. White's, but uh, there is a telephone pole out by um, Garthwaite here um, that um, we would that's existing here already that we would tinker around with. I just wonder if these people know what you know. So if there is a vote for on this project to move forward, then we would just like in the existing intersection project, we would then approach the you know the, the property owners. Um, it is fairly time consuming to do that. So I don't think I will take the step unless this is a go uh, and put the people kind of through that. Again, here we've got a backup plan come back into the bank. And I think that we have pretty good relationship there. Uh, there's an existing pole um, in the right of way out by the apartment there. Um, this one here, we might have to move and we would have to work with um, somebody over on this side. Um, um, but, you know, for me to go and work with four landowners on a hypothetical um, until there's an actual vote taken, I, I feel fairly comfortable that we can work around it. And if it just doesn't, you know, can't come to fruition due to landowners, then it doesn't come to fruition. Okay. But um, I'd hate to 
before we even get voter approval, go through that step. Um, I think we can, you know, what we've done is we've put together some pretty detailed drawings at this point in time as to what this needs to do mm -hmm. and taken into some of the considerations and feedback that utility companies gave us. And then we're asking for some detailed cost estimates above and beyond what they gave us before. But we also have a, an alternative B at this point in time that we didn't have before mm -hmm. um, to give the board a choice. Um, we are getting painfully close in time frame in order to put this to the town meeting. Um, we'd have to have this in place by January. So um, there is a time frame you know, it'll back up till the end of January, and then there's certain things that we need to do through February and into town meeting dates that we need to hit mm -hmm. in order to do that. So we're cutting it a little bit close here. So the beginning of January, or what? Uh, I'd like to have this information back by the end, beginning of January. Oh, well, that's good news. Um, yeah, Mace Hill ditching. I uh, didn't think we were going to get that done. Uh, we are done with that. Got done. Um, uh, came out quite well. Um, just something to discuss. Phil, you had brought this up. I think it's going to warrant further discussion down the road. Um, you talked about maybe a culvert there coming down from the cemetery. Um, didn't put one in, but uh, with the ditching, I think Matt has a very good comment about parking there and, and our desire to have parking there. Mm -hmm. Or does someone pull off at this point in time? Pull off, yeah. At this point in time, you're you're in the lane. Or, or what the what um, cemetery? On this hill. Okay, if so you go up, it's on the left. Yes. Okay. So we are in the process of well, not in the process, but I think as we progress, I think that uh, we will, I think a lot of the conversation will probably want to revolve around perhaps parking down towards the intersection of Cobb Hill and um, Mace and um, perhaps we speak to the Howe family or somebody, um, there is a snowmobile trail that comes up that way and that might be the better way to yeah. deal with this. But um, Matt, I think put that out last time, but um, we can always go back and put the culvert in, but again, you'll end up with a car or two rate right in the travel lane so just yeah. something to think about okay. um can i ask a question about the mason mm -hmm. it appears from the width of the work the width of the ditches and everything um and i did ask someone about this it, it looks like all the trees that are impacted by the excavation of the roots that those trees you know we talked earlier about trees in the right of way of the town specific ash trees but it looks like those trees could be at risk over the next few years because their roots have been impacted of uh, basically dying and is that going to be part of the town's longer term plan is if those trees that line that road will present a hazard from the impact of their uh, of the excavation so that's been ditched before, so it's not really, I mean, it's, we've, we've re, you know, we've re-ditched it. Um, so I don't think this ditching in and of itself is going to be a root cause problem for the trees to die. However, that being said, uh, when I did walk down from um, the Merritt, you know, from Merritt down, uh, I did notice a good four trees maybe that were already dead. Uh, and felt as though this would be a good opportunity. Once the grass grows on that ditching side and kind of reestablishes itself, um, and I think that's some, I'll come back to that in a second, but um, once it reestablishes itself and we can kind of get in there with just, you know, feet and boots and stuff like that, I think it would be a good time to go in and take the ones out that um, for whatever reason have seen that they're better days. Um, it does look raw kind of after we do these. I would just, I would point, I would urge you to perhaps go walk, say, Webster Road, and once that grows in and reestablishes itself, how that kind of, the roots kind of re-hold and stuff like that, 
But I would say that due to the past ditching and what we've done, if there is a root system down in there, it's, it's been a, you know, it's been a yin and yang between highway growth and trees for some time. Not sure if that's truly what you wanted to hear. No, I'm, I was just curious about <laughs> okay. the plan for doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mentioned this in a past update. Uh, Hickok and Boardman had approached us on workers' comp and property liability, and et cetera. <coughs> I do expect to see um, some sort of a proposal for them, uh, and I would probably envision that being the first part of December at some point in time. That's uh, all turned into the weeks. It is. It is. Yeah. So I only, I'll just throw two thoughts. One, they, she is saying they can save us some decent money, so I think it is worth our while to consider this um, in a serious manner. I think that, um, you know, again, it'll be interesting to see. The caveat that I will throw out there is that the one reason BLCT does offer this insurance is that throughout the 80s, municipalities couldn't get it. And from a private sector, this has kind of ebbed and flowed as to availability and rates. And right now, the private sector seems to be very interested in it. So it is very, you know, advantageous from the private sector at this point in time. The caveat is, is that, you know, if everybody jumps on this bandwagon and five years from now, the private sector goes the other way again, then you now everybody, the whole reason why we banded together to do this in the first place, kind of. So we can get into that and we'll hear from BLCT as well, but certainly I think that um, I, it, it uh, behooves us to do our due diligence and certainly listen to this and, and look at the numbers and, and certainly take it into consideration. Um, again, um, it could be significant, so I think it's, um, um, we will we'll pass that along and we'll have some discussion on it. Does VLCT self-insure themselves with the pool of all the town's money, or do they use another carrier that's behind the scenes? I believe, my understanding is, is that VLCT is a true self-insured pool, mm -hmm. um, and that they, we have actuaries, et cetera. Uh, there's a board made up of select board members, town managers, uh, et cetera, a board of seven to 10 people that um, kind of make policy decisions on behalf of VLCT. Uh, regarding this, um, and it is BLCT members, for instance, Wayne Mazur that came uh, and talked about workers' compensation policies. Uh, when we had the water leak over at the rec center last winter, the winter before, uh, he came out and you know looked at it and followed up from an insurance point of view. So VLCT is the, uh, you know, essentially the manager of that pool and the, the town's, it's essentially a municipal pool, self-insured. It dates back to the 80s when we couldn't get it, so. Are you, are you sure that we are able to leave them if we want to? We are. Uh, there is a formal policy, and they have been notified that we are listening to Hickok and Boardman. So you need to notify them before November 1st that um, you, know, you are considering that. Uh, and I believe that's for actuarial purposes so that they can figure out what would happen if we were to leave. But uh, we are, uh, but again, Take this any way you want. Take it and listen. Mull it over for next year. Mull it over, you know, thank you very much. Um, but again, I think that um, if it presents the savings that we're talking about, I think it's at least something that you certainly should consider from a point of view, all points of view. Well, it's like car insurance. I mean, you can get cheap car insurance, but it's any good. I 
Are you going to be able to tell us that? What I can say at the moment is Hickok and Borman has a very good reputation, and they'll pull from, they will actually pull from a pool of, um, you know, actual insurers that you've heard of. Um, they are essentially an agent. They will marry you with, you know, the best, you know, um, insurance company that they, you know, um, sell for. Uh, and they'll kind of look after that. But I can say that Hickok and Borman has a good reputation. Other towns have decided to go with Hickok and Borman. Um, so it is a consideration. Again, I would just put on the flip side, private insurance has ebbed and flowed over the years and VLCT has been a consistent. Uh, the other big thing that has been spending, uh, taking up a fair amount of our time and concern and um, is the Mace Hill culvert. Um, we have, we met Chris Bump and Scott Jensen both uh, Chris Bump is our transport agency of transportation district four guy, and Scott Jensen is the stream alteration guy. And the as we mentioned at a last update, the hydrology study basically it was wrong. It's not seven feet. Hydrology st study actually says ten feet wide would be best. Uh, however, it's a bridge. Um, it's a box culvert. <laughs> it's, uh, it is bigger than four and a half feet, let's put it that way. Um, although we thought we were there measuring, we thought maybe it was a little bit bigger than four and a half feet. But um, uh, either way, we're constrained by the canal, particularly in the back, um, towards the, as it heads towards the bridal shop type direction. Um, and on the inflow as well. So that is we're, we're in the middle, we're putting together an RFP for this, and we're working on the wording that is going to kind of <coughs> let the designer know that we need this to be as big as possible, although it's probably, we probably won't get the size that the hydrology study is asking for, but as big as possible based upon the constraints of the, essentially the canal, the waterway. Um, we are also looking into a potential closure of that structure. So if anybody has been by there since or lately, it uh, has creeped out. Um, it is the stone structure below is, um, there have been stones dislodged, the concrete is substandard and um, there is a, about a foot of gravel road underneath the three feet of pavement. Um, and on one particular side, that gravel road has kind of e eroded out. And as that erodes out the side, the pavement kind of falls and it just kind of falls into the stream side. So um, we have, or we are, we either did today or are going to very shortly put some barricades out, which will kind of make that lane a little smaller than it is now. So it truly would be a one lane bridge or one way culvert. However, we feel as though if we're going to close this culvert before Thanksgiving would be optimal rather than trying to put signs up or put a detour route together in February. Um, and, um, you know, we've seen, uh, I'll call it erosion for lack of a better term on that roadway in the six months that this has been closed as it is. So we suspect that by the time March rolls around, which is another six months, we'll see more. Um, and we would rather have a controlled closing rather than a, okay, now what do we do? Um, so the option would be Bowers Road? Yep. So Cobb Hill would be affected, uh, the two row houses right there on the Cobb Hill side of that culvert would be, they'd be like, okay, I can, I can see, yeah. uh, I can touch the other side, but I can't get there. Um, um, would that, would, if that happened, would that uh, accelerate the uh, repair timing? No. No, we actually can't get in there until July 15th anyway. Um, but it needs to be designed. 
and then um, by the time they get done with the design, we'll have to turn around and put it out the bid um, for a contractor. But, but it is conceivable that it could be done next summer. Uh, we would hope to try and get that done by next summer. Well, we'll get on with it. Hmm. I mean, it would have to be done next summer. It couldn't be closed. Another whole season, could it? It would be. So we would like to try and get it done by the summer. Uh, last thing, I am November eighteenth. Meeting is our next one. Uh, we did this last year, and I would propose that we do it again this year. Uh, I am shooting for budget presentation for the November eighteenth meeting. I would like to turn around and have a special meeting on November 25th, the following Monday, although it just happens to be Monday before Thanksgiving. But you've given away your mixer, so you will not be It's cooking. also my birthday. I'm not uh, real thrilled about being here on my birthday. Oh, cake. come on. I'll yeah. be I'm not, a cupcake for you. Okay. I'm not doing sweets right now. <laughs> if you make yourself a cake, I'll help you eat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You make yourself a cake, I'll help you. Oh, that's so thoughtful of you. Isn't it? <laughs> See, we're thinking about you. You guys are really, really wonderful. The reasoning for that is um, I feel better having, the, having leaving the two meetings in December for budget discussion um, with the select board if they need it, because it should be adopted by that first meeting in January. Yeah. So, um, we will have other things coming down the pike um, in early December. Again, this Hickok and Borman thing I see. Um, you'll probably have VLCT at some point, maybe the following meeting. Um, you have Phil with some road stuff. Um, when is CATD coming back? Uh, maybe December 2nd. Um, if not, maybe the 18th, but I'd really like to try and keep the 18th for a budget discussion and kind of keep that focus there. And why are we having a special meeting? Because it's your birthday. Surprise! <laughs> That's right. Uh, because it generally has taken two meetings to go through the budget. So usually the first meeting, which does run about an hour, hour and a half, uh, is kind of a, from a macro perspective, the yeah. budget as a whole. Yeah. Reserve accounts and where the increases, you know, from a general kind of thing. And then the next one tends to be department specific. Um, and we get into some of the, the more details of things. Um, I mean, if you want to, when we go through it, we can talk about it all on the 18th. And <coughs> we can go to your house on the, eight, uh, the 25th, and so be it. <laughs> um, I should never have said that. <laughs> and we'll make sure everyone in town comes yeah, to town. Yeah. Maybe I'll listen, don't worry. <laughs> work. Uh, I can make it. Yeah, great. We'll sing. Huh? We'll sing. I'd like to hear How's that. that. Yes. Okay. okay. Sure. Yes, I'm here. My birthday. Last thing, uh, I don't know if anybody saw it, but it is in there. It's kind of under a communication thing, but um, we are in search of um, your phone number and address and all that good oh, stuff. What for, is that? It's for our records. Oh. As part of the impeachment inquiry, they've asked for you. <laughs> Address and phone number and which which name should I use? All that stuff. So okay. expect to see a subpoena next week. But okay. Um, well, if you have a paper version, I can figure that. I'll do it now. It is because we had an issue where Martin had to get hold of Gordon last week, and he didn't have an up-to-date phone number. Oh, this is Gordon's fault. Waltz okay. in in the afternoon, and we were able to get it, but. Um, I think it's just ignoring this. <laughs> yeah. In coordinating, when you said I can get that quick update on the Secretary of State. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, hold on, I mean, I got a paper copy here. I got it. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, Phil, Phil, wants, Phil went to the uh, Secretary of State's, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, transparency, transparency meeting. Yeah, that's something he did, uh, Secretary of State does every now and then. So he would like to uh, just give some that. Just a few quick comments. Oh, yeah. um, the meeting was in two parts. One to talk about um, the open meeting and privacy laws and documents. Um, and the other is actually on uh, what the state is doing for securing um, the state systems, especially the election uh, systems. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, um, you know, there, there, there was lots of uh, slides which I, I was happy to see. I wasn't surprised to see two-factor authentication of actually using other uh, security systems as the systems talk to one another. Um, so the state, I feel, is taking a modern approaches to its system, which I could not have said that five, seven years ago. So I was pretty impressed. Um, the other very interesting piece, uh, which never really struck me, but if you can envision, envision our voting in this room, um, there's a collection box over in this corner here where the ballots go in. And that evening, uh, that, that box has the ability to tabulate, you know, it's an it's a optical mark reader. Um, um, and, and then there's a series of volunteer groups that verify and check everything, and then the information is reported to the Secretary of State's office or somewhere that night. The important thing there is that that is a, a decentralized system. So it's, it's not hackable from, from uh, which is what the modern worry is on, on election systems. Um, that stated what is uh, uh, um, vulnerable in the state is the state uh, voter registration list, uh, because that actually is a state system. It's online. and. Um, like any modern uh, protection systems, they know people have been knocking on the door trying to get at that. Um, so, so it was a good um, higher level overview of, of the systems and I think the way feeling pretty good as I said. And also the fact that we are in a decentralized mode uh, is actually protecting us in the long run. Um, I, I don't think I have very much to say with the open meeting laws and the privacy other than we have to do due diligence and make sure that we, you know, continue to do the, be open and, and uh, be careful. Um, I'm more worried about the clerk's responsibilities uh, for the records. There seems to be another whole set of um, privacy issues which obviously never come across my horizon. Um, but the, how they act with the gen, interact with the general public to get those records. Uh, they are public records, and it, and it seems like the Secretary of State said that of issues in small towns, usually it's in that records area. Um, so he had no specific recommendations. Um, the slideshow is available. I can sort of send stuff to folks if they're interested. But, um, but kudos to the Secretary of State. He was traveling around making maybe four or five presentations uh, across the state to to the group. And, um, so. And so. That's good of you to go. Okay. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. Okay, so what is my name? This is, okay, this is your emergency contact. No, I didn't mean, I was getting you know, those fictitious names. Oh, uh, oh. oh. I didn't read it at first. Uh, what do you, I don't. Can I do one minute? Anything else? No. You got any issues? You know, my statement on that. Okay. Um, do I have issues or not? You do. That's personal information. Yes, yes. They ask me that all the time. Do I have issues? Well, yeah, everyone does. I'd like, like to say more. <laughs> Not tonight. <laughs> Maybe on my birthday. Town issues. I'm glad that you said it that way. Okay. Now you're on record. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> so 
we're done. Yes. We're done.